Okay, folks, welcome to my vlog. This is Paul Chamberlain, the Air Force guy. Coming to you, this is the fourth vlog in my series I just started this year. For those of you just joining for the first time, well, welcome. Appreciate you watching. Uh, check out the rest of my channel. I have some, uh, in, in my opinion anyway, and some comments that I've received. I have some very good videos, reviews of different campers, uh, as well as how-to videos. If there's something in particular that you'd like me to talk about in my vlog, by all means, give me a comment below. For those of you joining me again, have watched my other videos, welcome back. Appreciate you watching. Again, give me a thumbs up if you think I'm doing a good job. Comment below if there's something in particular you'd like me to talk about. By all means, please do uh, go ahead and uh, comment below and I'll be more than happy to see if I can uh, oblige you. Also, I do have my contact information below, both email, phone numbers. By all means, feel free to reach out to me if I could be of any assistance to you. This evening, we're gonna cover three different topics. First off, we're gonna talk about refrigerators for RVs, whether it's being gonna be an RV refrigerator or whether we're talking about a residential refrigerator. Secondly, we're gonna talk about cost of RVs. Uh, and third, we're gonna be talking to you about trade values and what that means to you. So let's get started here. And first thing we're gonna talk about is RV refrigerators or refrigerators for RVs. Now, typically, the only time that you're gonna have an option for this, uh, what we're gonna be talking about this evening, is typically gonna be in a fifth wheel or a motorhome. And what we're talking about is whether or not an RV refrigerator, meaning two-way refrigerator, or if a residential refrigerator is best for you. So let's get down to it and explain to you the differences. Most of you might already realize that an RV refrigerator takes a good 12 to 24 hours for it to cool down. And you must be level. The more level you are, obviously the better off the refrigerator cools down. Also, you realize that it, you have an automatic switch, meaning that in the event that you unplug from shore power, it will automatically switch over to propane, assuming two things are there. One, you have propane. Two, you have battery power. Um, so that is a benefit there. Now, let's talk about some issues that you might have with an RV refrigerator. Most RV refrigerators, meaning two-way or even three-way refrigerators, typically do not have air circulation. Now, there are some out there. Uh, one in particular, the uh, ones in the grand design, uh, the 18 cubic foot, they do have actually, actually do have air circulation in them. But for the most part, your Dometic refrigerators do not or even your Norcold do not have air circulation in them. Uh, that is something you can always add to it. But for the most part, and I don't know if anybody, if you've uh, experienced this or not, and that is you go ahead and put things in your refrigerator and the top shelf, uh, you notice that either those items are either colder or frozen, whereas the things down below tend to be not as cold. That is due to the fact that there's no air circulation. So what you want to do is not overstuff that top shelf in an RV refrigerator. And they do have little portable fans that you can put in battery operated that will circulate the air in an RV refrigerator. Um, so that is that. Now, a benefit of the RV refrigerator is the fact that it will run for those of you that are going to be doing boondocking, an RV refrigerator may be better for you unless you have some type of power source. And the reason for that is because it's using propane as well as battery power in order to operate. Now, for those of you that uh, may feel a need to have a residential refrigerator, one thing benefit of a residential refrigerator is the fact that they cool down quicker. Uh, the fact that they can be larger. You know, they have different style refrigerator freezers and so forth. Um, however, and they're also they're gonna have air circulation. So that's gonna be a better uh, for you. So you're not gonna have that issue with stuff freezing and not being cold and so forth. However, a downside for those of you that may be considering boondocking, it may not be right for you and here's why. 
you pull over for the night, you know, you pull over after a day of driving, it's eight o'clock at night, you're not gonna be leaving until eight o'clock the next morning. Well, typically, if you have a two battery system with an inverter, and that's how an electric, R, uh, R, um, electric refrigerator working, so a residential refrigerator working in an RV basically is using an inverter using the DC power, which is your battery, and it inverts it from DC to AC so that it can operate. Now in doing so, typical feedback that I get is it's gonna last you eight to 10 hours. Now, that all depends on what else you might be using in that coach. You know, if you're using your power vent fan to circulate air, how many lights, number of different variations, uh, variables that you have with that. So keep that in mind when you're shopping for your next RV and whether a residential refrigerator or an RV refrigerator will be better for you. So next up, let's talk about cost of RVs. You know, one thing I get hammered on consistently on my YouTube channel is why the heck are these little teardrop campers so darn expensive? And folks, you've got to, and, and most of you might even know this already, but you've got to put things in perspective as far as what we're looking at. One, where is this manufacturer located? If they're not located in Elkhart, Indiana, like the majority of the RV industry is, well, obviously they're gonna be paying more for the materials. One, because of where they are. Secondly, because they're a smaller company, so they're buying in smaller quantities. Uh, you know, your larger manufacturers, when they're building RVs, they, they're tending to be closer to their, their source of materials. Some of them manufacture their own materials as well. Uh, but being a larger conglomerate, you know, like your Forest Rivers, your Thors, you know, Winnebago, they tend to have, be buying in bulk, and so they're getting a better price break. Also, they're building, they could be building anywhere from 10 to 20 a day, whereas a smaller RV dealer might only be, you know, making three to five, maybe seven units a day. Their labor costs are higher. Some cases, these smaller RV companies are using higher cost materials. Um, in their uh, materials, whether it's it's the Aldi system, whether it's you know the water heater, you know an on-demand water heater, whether it's the material they're using in the sidewalls. So there's a lot of different variations or variables to why these smaller campers cost more than one that may be twice, three, four times the size. So keep that in mind uh, when you see that. And like I say, if you have any particular questions on any of this, uh, by all means, sh shoot me a comment below. Now let's talk about RV costs. Uh, I'm sorry, not RV costs. Let's talk about the RV, your trade value in the event that you were looking to trade your, or even if you're gonna look to sell it outright. Now, when you're looking to trade it to a dealer, what are the variables that a dealer is looking at to put a value on your trade? One, they're gonna look at the age of the unit. Now, why would the age of the unit matter? Well, if you're looking to trade a 2018 for a 2018 model, that's gonna be a pretty tough thing. You gotta keep in mind that, you know, if you, for instance, was going into a dealership and you had two different units you're looking at, both of them are 2018, one's a, a used, one's brand new, how much less money is the 2018 gonna have to be than the new one? for you to be interested in buying the pre-owned. So there's gonna be a continue, a considerable amount of money um, difference with those in order uh, to make them attractive to someone else buying. Now, by the same token, if you have something that's quite old, I, I know in, in, in our particular situation, we have um, warranty companies not willing to put any warranty on them if they're over, if they're eight or nine, I believe it's eight years uh, age. So anything over eight years old, then there's no warranty, extended warranties that are available for them. Um, on top of that, from a dealer's perspective, if they're selling something that's aged like that is, are they gonna be selling it most of chance, most likely they're gonna be selling that as an as is piece, meaning what you see is what you get. 
And so obviously when you sell a unit that way, it's gonna be worth less money. Now, also it depends, there's a lot of variables as well, meaning what time of the season is it? You know, we're talking about, on, and I'm talking East Coast now because I know it's different in different areas of the country. You know, Florida's gonna be different than here. Arizona's different. They're all different everywhere. But you've gotta look at the season of when you're looking to trade your particular unit. And what is the marketability of your particular trade? Also, what they're gonna be looking at is, is there any damage? Meaning, you know, did you get in an accident? Uh, anything falling off, falling apart? Is there any water damage? I can't tell you how many times we trade a unit and we specifically ask the questions, is there any water damage? No, no water leaks, no nothing. You know, no soft walls, no soft floors, no stains in the ceiling, none of that. It comes in and heaven forbid, I mean, we find that there's water damage and for whatever reason, and sometimes it is legit that the uh, customer does not know that they actually have water damage in their unit until we actually point it out to them. Uh, so those are some of the variables. Um, let's see what else. Uh, let's also is something else that we've got to look at is what is the bank's willing to finance for your unit? Uh, because that makes makes a difference also. Um, hopefully that helps you with the consideration if you're looking to uh, trade your unit. Now, I do have some people that go ahead and sell theirs outright. You know, it's it's weird how things work, but it is amaze it amazes me how many people that I talk to in a given year that are okay with going to buy an RV from a private party and paying more than what book value is. I mean, when I'm talking about a retail book versus paying under retail at a dealer. It just amazes me that people do that. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's the fact that the individuals feel like if they're talking to the previous owner directly, that they feel like they're getting told the truth about the unit um, and they feel much better. So a lot of different variables out there. And again, it's case by case, people. Uh, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Um, if for some reason you know you're going into a dealer and it looks like they're giving you too much for your trade it's just that they're just not coming down off theirs as much so if you are looking at two different dealers and you're trading a unit don't look at what they're actually uh, giving you for your trade value look at what the bottom number is going to be what we call the difference number meaning if they're selling a unit for hundred thousand they're giving you fifty thousand for yours we have a fifty thousand dollar difference uh, because those games can be played. I mean, we could jack it up. I could say I'm selling you my unit for 120000 giving you 70000 for your trade, so we're still at $50,000 difference. So look at those numbers um, when you're trading. Also, when you're trading, look at all of the additional costs that a dealer may be adding over and above what they're sa saying the selling price is. You know, are they going to charge you additional uh, freight? Are they going to charge you additional prep? Are they going to charge you uh, uh, public official fees, documentation fee, emergency alert fee? I mean, you have all these different fees that some dealers charge you, and look at that and take that into consideration. Um, your best price is not always your best deal. Well, so I hope you appreciate it. Hope you uh, liked what I went over here this evening. And if there's anything else uh, that you'd like me to cover, if for some reason you have a specific question yourselves, by all means, reach out to me, email, give me a call. Be more than happy to um, try and answer your specific question. Um, subscribe to my page. Check out my other uh, videos. Got some great things coming down the line. And uh, thanks again for watching. We'll come back at you again next week.